and had just got done healing a woman whom the doctors couldn't help. Jesus truly has the answer. But only those who really understand Him, who know Him, who have experienced Him, can say that. When there's a bumper sticker that says Jesus is the answer, okay, that's just a bumper sticker. But if you and I are able to say that in sincerity, then it means something. But it's not going to be, oh, that's, that's a, such a great Christian saying. I should go around saying that. If, you, if it comes out of your mouth and you don't believe it or you're not convinced or your life is just dull and you haven't experienced Jesus, you can't say that. People who have salvation can declare the gospel. People who don't have salvation are not going to be convincing when they say Jesus is the Savior of the world. It just, it's just weak. There's no passion in it. There is no power in it. If I say I believe in Jesus, I better be convinced. Because anybody can say the statement, but only those who really have a relationship with Jesus and are building their lives around Him can say that with conviction and with power. So, encouraging others and being a testimony, it's only effective when you already have a relationship with Him. And being optimistic when everybody else is pessimistic and being real. That only happens because we actually know the power of Jesus and, and we have a relationship with Him. When death occurs and tragedy strikes and disaster overwhelms us, we are the only ones who can say, things will get better. Nobody else can say that. Because if they're unbelievers, even if they get out of the situation, they end up completely and totally and eternally separated from the Lord. Even though if the worst tragedies happen, we get burned at the stake, we get decapitated. Okay? When we see a Christian online, ISIS, whoever, does it. Remember, they're not the only ones, the Christians that got beheaded, they're not the only ones who got their heads beheaded in the history of persecution. Okay? We can still look at that and say, it's going to get better. We're the only ones who can say that. Nobody else can say it. If, you're, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you can never say that. You can't falsely encourage people. Because ultimately, all of that stuff is going to pass for us. That individual who is a child of God is going to give a brand new body that won't be susceptible to a, a beheading. In eternity, you can't even try. I mean, you can try, but it's never going to happen. You can never cut off somebody's head in, in uh, eternity. It's impossible. I mean, Jesus walked through a wall. Right? You can let a knife pass. No blood. Can't kill him. Can't kill us. Throughout eternity, we won't be able to die. It's not going to happen. Because we have a spiritual body. Only believers can truly be optimistic. And we get our encouragement from the Lord. Thirdly, don't get upset when people discourage you. What do you do? Ignore it. Okay? So here it is. They're only doing what comes naturally to them. Jesus went to the house, found the mourners, crying and wailing. Jesus tells the tells them that the girl is asleep, not dead. But what did they do? They laugh at him. <clears throat> they didn't get upset at Jesus, they just laughed at him. That's amazing. They just laughed at him. So what was Jesus' response? We look in the text, and Jesus' response is... Nothing. Nothing. He 
totally ignores them. There's no response from Jesus. There's no response from Jesus toward this unbelief and inappropriateness. They're laughing at a funeral. They thought Jesus was inappropriate. I mean, they just took the cake. They mock him. He didn't even correct them. He just totally ignored them. Walked away and said, get out. Because he put everybody out. All your mourners, get out. You're fired. Don't need you. Because I'm going to do something that you're not even going to believe. Because you just didn't believe me when I told you. She was asleep, and I'm going to wake her up. Up. So only Jesus can actually do something like this. I mean, he does all kinds of inappropriate things in John concerning Lazarus. But we won't go into that. When we get to that passage, I'll share that with you. But he does all kinds of inappropriateness in a funeral. And it's just crazy. Alright? So... Only Jesus is able to back up his words, and so he can say some things like this. And when we say at a funeral, okay, when we say at a funeral, oh, she's a Christian, she's only asleep. Jesus is going to wake her up, uh, like, you know, soon. We can think that, but don't say it. Why? Because that's not appropriate at this time. For you and for me. Jesus can say that. But you can't say it. Even though it's true. Your job and my job at a funeral is to live in the moment. Mourn with those who mourn. Respect and honor and encourage by your presence. Not necessarily your words. Okay? If you go to a funeral and you think you need to say something, shut up. You don't have to. Just your presence is enough. Right? So don't feel like you're obligated and you have to say something and ruin it. A lot of people do. They don't know what to say and they say something and... That was my sister, you know, my brother, I drag him outside and hit him. Shut up. Not appropriate. Just be there and love it. Okay? You don't have to say anything. Let Jesus do all the talking. Let the Holy Spirit do all the comforting, you know, internally. Right? And then, respect authority always. Look at what Jesus does. Even though the healing was meant for the private audience, He honored the parents and 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 respected their authority as the father and the mother of the daughter and let them see the miracle. So what did he do? He chased everybody out, grabbed the parents and the three disciples that he brought. Five people other than Jesus witnessed this miracle of the resurrection. Jesus didn't have to let them in. He could have just healed her and brought her out to, his, uh, to her parents. He didn't do that. They saw the miracle. He respected their authority and their responsibility as, their, as her parents. Okay? So, I mean, look at this. When I realized this, is amazing. Long before they came up with the safeguard of protecting the care provider, Jesus was already practicing this principle. You know, the, in, in, uh, in an examination room, the doctor can't examine the patient without the, the nurse present now. It used to be they could do that by themselves. But now, new procedure, you can't do that by yourself. Why? Because of malpractice and mistreatment and all that kind of accusation stuff. So now, the nurse has to be there. Um, especially if you are a gynecologist. Two people have to be there so that everything is witnessed and they make sure that everything is appropriate. So Jesus was already practicing good professional care here. Not that he was concerned about it, but he's certainly a good example. 
It showed respect for the parents' authority and gave them the privilege of seeing the miracle so that he would not be accused of anything inappropriate. Okay? She was 12 years old. So, <clears throat> based on this principle, when I was in youth ministry, I never drove one person who was a female in the passenger seat. She had to sit in the back. And this was the same way with a pastor who was uh, at GMC, when he had to take a uh, lady church member home or you know, somewhere else, she sat in the back. Because we didn't want any kind of uh, opportunity for people to talk about a, a situation that may have been inappropriate. I report everything that I do to my wife if there is a female involved in it. So I have a student and the place that we needed to meet was at her house. This is an adult um, married student that I had, have. So in order to go there, I took my son with me. So that there wouldn't be anything. I asked her, is your husband going to be home? And she said, no. Then I will bring my son with me. So my son went with me. Okay? So that nothing will be seen as inappropriate. Jesus was already practicing that way back then. Okay? Now, lastly, keep private matters private and public matters public. And what, and what do I mean by that? So Jesus, for some reason, tells the parents not to tell anybody about this resurrection. And to this day, I still don't know why. I can't figure it out. I mean, there are theories, okay? Well, he doesn't want to be too popular, so if the resurrection thing goes out, then other people are going to come to him for, you know, resurrection too. And he'll be just totally inundated. And I can understand that logic and that, that reasoning. But we're not given the reason. We're left to conjecture on our own what would happen. Sometimes, you know, when I have, when I have stuff to give away to little kids, you know, maybe a kit of gum or candy or whatever, and I find one, I give it to the child and I say, don't tell anybody. Okay? It's boo, okay. So they enjoy it on their own. Okay? The children enjoy it on their own. Uh, why do I do that? Well, one of the primary things is not just because I'm going to be inundated by other kids and then I have to give up all of my treats all at once, which I don't want to. I mean, I'm not going to eat it, but I don't want to give it all away. It's gone, right? The reason why I did that mainly was because I wanted this individual, this child, to feel special. So in order for this to be a real special act for this child and for these parents, perhaps Jesus said, don't tell anybody. You can't deny it. The girl's going to be walking around. She's going to go out and play. Hey, wait a minute, didn't she die? Oh. <laughs> can't say anything. I mean... It's not like that, right? No, no, no. He's going to have to say, the parents are going to have to say, yes, Jesus raised them. But I'm not going to intentionally go out there and just blurt it out. If somebody asks, great, I'll tell them. But if nobody asks, or I'm not going to go out of my way to tell everybody. And here Jesus specifically doesn't, don't do it. I don't know why. I mean, really, I have guesses, and other people have guesses, but the Lord doesn't tell us. And we have no idea, truly, why. What we are responsible for is obedience. If the Lord tells us to do something, even if we don't understand it, we obey. And this was a matter of quietness. It was supposed to be a secret. If it is, then great, keep it. If Jesus tells you not to say anything, then don't. 
But more than that, okay, there are more things that he wants us to say than he doesn't. And the gospel is like that. Gospel is a public matter. It is not a private matter. This resurrection was a private matter, but the gospel is a public matter. If he tells us to share it, then we share it. We tell everybody so that they too can have a relationship with Jesus. They too can exercise faith in Him. They too can understand and have a relationship that's alive. But if Jesus tells us not to say anything, we don't. Even if we don't understand it. We are obedient either way. The next passage is just another situation. There's nothing after this passage. Give her something to eat, uh, to eat and he leaves. Tells, her, tells the parents not to say anything, but give her something to eat, and then he leaves. Nothing. We're not given anything. No explanation. Nothing. So, our responsibility is obedience. If it's a gospel, we share it. If it's something private, we don't. And whatever is appropriate, we determine it by how God leads us. We live in obedience no matter what. We live in faith no matter what. That's how we follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much by demonstrating through the life of Jesus who you are. And of course you and Jesus are one. And whatever we see Jesus doing, you are doing. And whatever you are doing, Jesus is doing. So we can't get it confused. We thank you that at times you command us to do things that we don't understand. You told Abraham to move to a place that he doesn't even know where. And you said you will reveal it at a later time. And you did. We want to be obedient to you no matter what. Whether we understand it or not. If we are to live by every word that comes from your mouth, then help us to hear it, read it, study it, and then live by it for your glory and honor. Because your glory and honor is what we see. And you deserve it. So we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.